Okay. Hello, everybody. Um, I think we got everybody rolling up here on the display. Uh, there's a few ways you can interact with us today. One is by chatting in the chat box of Zoom, and the other is using the Q&A feature to post a question. Throughout the presentation, I will try to check in with the Q&A. And especially if there's any issues with the video feed or sound, uh, make sure to type that into either the chat or the Q&A so that that pops up. We are gonna get started here uh, and run through a presentation that should last us uh, you know, approximately one to two hours. However, if there's a lot of questions, we wanna make sure that we dive into those right away and get to anybody's questions. So um, we're going to roll into it now. So first of all, welcome to today's presentation. This is Get to Know Grit. Uh, Grip Approach is a seminar series, and it's a system that we developed here in the Chicago area uh, at my clinic, Cornerstone Health. Grip stands for global, meaning full body, rehabilitation, and injury prevention. In today's workshop, we have attendees um, that are joining us from a couple different areas. We have many registrants from the USA, from Taiwan, and from Japan. So when we go into presenting, I'm going to try to say things in a way that should be a little easier to translate into each of these locations. Uh, so some things might be slightly skewed in the presentation, but we can get into any details that might not be understood. We also have a wide variety of professions in today's presentation from chiropractors to physical therapists. We have athletic trainers, personal trainers, and just general movement specialists. So the presentation will try to talk to each of these individuals. There's a few big goals. First, we do want to introduce you to GRIP approach and give you some clear examples of how GRIP can impact your practice, can make things work a little bit easier for you, either in the clinic or in a movement-related field. We also want to connect you with our live courses. After being a little compact for a few years with COVID, we're now branching out to teach more of our live courses again here in the US as well as in Asia. So we'll make sure to talk about the different types of GRIP courses and what you might choose uh, as your pathway for learning GRIP. We're going to cover my background. We'll discuss how to find some common threads between different types of approaches. We'll talk about how and why I developed GRIP approach and how you can organize and systematize what you do using GRIP approach. And we'll also talk about how to apply your skills with intent and standing out as an expert and plenty of time for question and answer. So let's start with my background. I am a doctor of chiropractic. I graduated from National University of Health Sciences in Chicago in 2013. And I'm also a dynamic neuromuscular stabilization or DNS practitioner. That's a program that I studied when I was going through school. I then hosted and have traveled uh, extensively to both uh, host and take DNS courses. So that's a big foundational part of my background. I'm the founder of Grip Approach, which we're going to be talking about today, and also the clinic director of Cornerstone Health, where we developed Grip and where we continue to fine tune it and apply it with all of our patients and athletes. And within our clinic, we also have Foundational Fitness. That is our gym. It's a functional strength training program that's run in a circuit. And that's developed out of grip and out of cornerstone to be the perfect place for our clinic patients to get stronger, whether it's the last part of their rehab, first part of their discharge, 
or if we want to take an athlete and work them through some off-season performance training, we'll also do that in the foundational fitness setting. In my background, uh, I've been fortunate to work with a lot of different individuals, um, first through lecturing classes like this, uh, national conferences, and traveling to teach our coursework, either in an open group or with sports organizations and universities. I typically present between 20 and 30 GRIP courses or concepts per year, and our manuals are translated into seven languages. Uh, we do have an opportunity to consult with different organizations, and when I do that consulting, it's usually showing them how we can help their approach become more systemized, where every level of an organization can start to see the same thing and take action on the same thing through GRIP approach. And then we'll show some unique techniques that we've developed as well. Our mission through all of the branches of what we do, cornerstone, foundational fitness, and grip approach is to resolve chronic pain, first in Chicago and then globally. Now, that focus is applicable both to our patients of all ages and to our athletes. If you work with athletes either at the high school level or professional level, you'll know that many of them are working through discomfort and pain that can be chronic. Example would be turf toe or a chronic hip injury that somebody plays through. And we've found that working with our athletes with that same mindset of resolving chronic issues has been very impactful. And GRIP will help us apply our skills very well to that population. A little look into our facility. Uh, this is our reception area on the left of the screen and right of the screen. And on the right of the screen here is a picture of our gym. It's about 1,500 square feet. Uh, we have a little more equipment in there now. Uh, but we use free weights, kettlebells, medicine balls, and resistance bands primarily. And that will take our group classes from basic mobility work on the floor, all the way through barbell strength training and kettlebell and sandbag performance training. And then a typical treatment room, like the one I'm standing in, is there on the left of your screen. So a little look at how we operate on a daily basis. What my practice does is uh, build a reputation uh, around excellent care, especially for the most complex cases. Our bread and butter or, or key population are patients that have tried to get better in a couple different areas and still felt, felt stuck. And then we like to take those cases and evaluate them through GRIP, identify really clearly what's going on and help them get better. So because of this, we've become a favorite place for other providers to send their patients if the case is stuck. We try to do everything the right way. So if there's a lot of different ways we could approach the case, we're always looking and saying, what is the absolute best option for the patient? And then we can negotiate from there, but we don't wanna cut corners. Um, we're the place that tries to do everything right. That means a very thorough examination. We try to speak very clearly with our patients and we use treatments and, and exercises that are backed by the best research available. And we always are progressing our patients towards fitness, towards exercise, and towards mobility. We also coordinate care. So if a gym refers a, a client to us for a clinical care, we are always in communication with that provider, trying to teach them what we found and how that gym can tweak their training a little bit to get improved results with that client and make sure they avoid injury. We also bring all of the best methods together under one roof. So some patients come to us and they're only seeking healthcare or recovery and others seek us only for movement or strength training. But most of our, our clients and patients come here on the clinic side, trying to really restart or rebuild their health. And then they progress into our fitness and they work with us on both sides of our facility.
We make sure to systematize everything so it's very clear and structured so our providers and our patients know exactly what we're going to do step by step from start to finish. No, no confusion along the way. And we do that because GRIP guides everything we do. GRIP gives us a really clear framework to know what's going on with the client and exactly which steps that we can follow. So how did we get there? Beyond everybody's core professional education, whether you're a chiropractor, PT, movement specialist, after the basics, we all seek different skills or seminars to try to get better at what we do to make a bigger impact and differentiate ourselves. So uh, there's a great quote from an osteopath that I studied with, Leon Chaitel, uh, and he would always recommend study everything, study everyone, take what you find useful, and then make it your own. And I'll show you a couple of the things that I studied uh, that led into the need for creating grip approach. So these are a few of the formal areas of study. Motion Palpation Institute, which is a chiropractic-focused seminar company that teaches really how to palpate or feel the way the spine is moving in three separate planes of motion. And wherever that motion is most stuck, they teach how to apply a really good chiropractic adjustment or mobilization to the joint. Dynamic Neuromuscular Stabilization, or DNS, that is a branch off of the study of developmental oncogenesis or baby movement. So when we study how babies move from uh, when they're born all the way through the first few years of life, DNS helps us look at that as a standard and apply it to patients of all ages and backgrounds. Postural Restoration Institute is another focus uh, here. It's a US-based PT approach that has some connections with DNS in the way we look at the diaphragm function and how that will affect posture and control of the entire body. And neurodynamic solutions. This is the look at the way our peripheral nerves, like our sciatic nerve, travels from the spine down to the leg and where it can become impinged or entrapped and some really good movement techniques to help recover nerve health. I've also studied acupuncture and dry needling through Dr. Ma. And Dr. Ma teaches a type of acupuncture or dry needling that focuses on where the nerve attaches to the muscle, the neuromuscular junction in a full system that's similar to traditional acupuncture but is also similar to some of the dry needling methods that you've seen. I think it's more important to meaningfully deploy the skills you have rather than try to collect every skill. So I, I'm saying I'd love you for you to dig deep into a single program and get really good at applying it before adding another program to it versus taking one class and a hundred different methods. That being said, I, I love to study and learn. So a few of the other sources that really influenced me, uh, Leon Chaitao has dozens of books that are very impactful. You can pick those up. Um, they're all very good. Sean Allen is a personal mentor of mine. He also has a website called The Gate Guys, a uh, very in-depth look at biomechanics. Sean Eno, who is a, a podorathist that builds functional performance foot orthotics. Robert Lardner, another personal mentor of mine who presents in DNS, in PRI, and in postural, uh, excuse me, primitive uh, primal reflex release technique, PRRT. And another deep dive into the Fascial Research Congress, which meets every few years to publish brand new papers on fascia. Lorimer Mosley, who talks about pain science and how we need to incorporate that into our gym setting, as well as in our clinic setting. And then, of course, a lot of really good strength programs like Starting Strength and Strong First have influenced what I do on a daily basis. But the issue often comes to how we apply this knowledge. It's not enough just to uh, collect a lot of these techniques. 
these methods and others can all help you produce really good outcomes. But if you use a single approach, if you only get good at just one thing, you can be known for getting really good results with that. A good example is Michael Shacklock. Michael Shacklock is the neurodynamics guy. He's a purist. He only does neurodynamics and he'll only accept cases which he believes have a big neurodynamic component and everybody else needs to be referred out. So if you have a nerve problem, a neurodynamic nerve problem, the best person in the world to go to is Michael Shacklock. But if you have a problem that's not neurodynamics, he won't accept you. He'll send you elsewhere. And that's okay. That's a great way to practice and become the expert in one specific area. But if you're like me, you want to explore multiple treatments, multiple trainings, so that you can be helpful to more people. So that anybody that comes to you is somebody that you can help on the mobility side, the clinic side, or in the gym. So hopefully you're like that and you're seeking other programs as well. The issue I ran into, and maybe you've run into this as well, is every different treatment system has its own criteria of how and when to apply it. And it can be really hard to mix everything together. It can be really challenging to integrate and know which of your methods you should use with the client. This is the first problem I had that we were trying to solve with grip approach. Many people feel stuck between all these different systems and they don't know exactly which rules to follow when they apply them. So what GRIP does is looks at where all of these areas are similar rather than all the spots that they're different. When I was applying DNS, I found that the areas I was most focused on with every patient were the same areas I was most focused on with PRI and the same areas I was most focused on with fitness. They had overlap in really key areas. So this was my, my big aha moment. I thought if everything was intersected in a specific area, then we should be able to have a system that ties everything together, that helps us make decisions of how to use a technique from DNS, a technique from motion palpation, a technique from strength training, all for the same mission with the patient. This is what we're trying to do with grip approach. So we needed a system that brought everything together, that integrated it. When I saw the connections between the systems, I thought we need a single like super test, one test that we can run that will show us exactly which things to plug into our approach with the patient or with the movement client. And so we went to work to develop that. If I could create that test that would address the whole body and respect the similarities between all the systems, I'd be able to use it for every single client. I wouldn't need to jump between systems. And when I learned new techniques, I could just plug those in to the same test or system that we created. So when we really went to work on that, I created a type of test called an FROM screen. That stands for functional range of motion screen. And this is one of our, our peak items of integration. So when I assess a patient, there's a few key things I go through. The first three points here are sort of our basic exam. We're going to look at the neurology and the orthopedic tests, just like I did before we started grip approach. And we'll look at neurodynamics. And then the bulk of what I do in assessment is the grip assessment, which has three components. It's the big movements or the macro movements. An example of that would be watching somebody throw a baseball, watching someone do tree pose in yoga, watching somebody get in and out of a chair and determining is that good or are there a few things that we don't like about the way they're moving? Or does the client feel like their pitch is off? They're, they're dropping 
the sinker a little bit too much, or they're getting caught when they're going into a deep squat. So that's the macro assessment, big picture of what's going on. Then we look at the NZR assessment. NZR stands for neutral zone of reference. We'll go into that a little bit more in a moment, but these NZRs are the four areas I spent most of my time coaching when I was applying DNS, when I was applying PRI. All of my eye and vocal coaching came down to four areas, yet it was very complicated to apply coaching to those four areas. So we sought to integrate and streamline and simplify how we coach those four key zones. And then finally, we go to our FROM, Functional Range of Motion screen. And this gives us our working data of how our whole team is going to work with a client. Let's look at neutral zones of reference. In all of our GRIP courses, you'll get exposure to neutral zones of reference and how to train them. And in fact, if you sign up for our free class on our website, there are videos on neutral zone of reference assessment and training right in that free course. The two main functions of an NZR one is to establish a pattern of motor control or body control that's safe, that's durable, meaning it won't break down, and that is powerful, meaning it can make a big impact on the person. And we do that by focusing on these four zones. Let's look at each of those elements. When we talk about body control, it's a mixture of the way the programming part of your brain sends a mechanical signal through the peripheral nervous system and activates the physical part of your body, the muscles and joints to create motion. So it's a program, a signal, and then actual contraction would be our motor control. When we think about joint movement or flexibility, just being flexible could be me lifting an arm above head or me bending a finger back. But controlled mobility or motor control is how the individual moves their arm or bends the finger. And often there's a gap between flexibility, which does not use the brain to control it as heavily, and motor control, which requires your brain to create that action. So when we look at a key area, like NZR1, for example, is the lumbopelvic canister, we're looking for a position we can put the body into where the brain really likes that position. It says, okay, my back is relatively flat and neutral. My diaphragm is breathing down the way it's supposed to. My abdominal wall is expanding a little bit as my diaphragm reaches down. And the brain gets kind of happy with that presentation. And it allows the muscles around the back, hips, and shoulders to relax when that area is positioned well and working well. So if we go back to the slide, if I set NZR1 in a really good position and I get relaxed muscle control around the belly and back, when I increase loads, like doing a squat, my hips are going to be in better position my neck is going to be in better position because I've set up my NZR as well. I know it's hard to get a picture of that without a, a live presentation, uh, but in all of our classes, we'll show you how to really simply position the body and cue it so that type of control spreads throughout the body. We also use the NZR as our base point. So when I'm moving through an arm test, I'm also looking at the NZR and I'm trying to make sure we don't lose our quality of the NZR while I'm moving the body. So it helps us get a better functional test. It also helps to tie everything together in that all of my systems, PRI, DNS, motion palpation, neurodynamics, they all work better when we have NZRs well-established, when we have that neutral control well-established. So in addition to NZR1, 
We have NZR2 that looks at the position of the shoulder in the front and the back. NZR3, which looks at the position of the neck, front, sides, and back, and how we use that with the core. And NZR4, which is the neutral position of the foot and toes, including balance. Once we've established our NZRs, we're gonna go into our key functional range of motion tests. So these tests are built from the head to the toe, every body region and every movement that you could create with your body, we have a test for it. That's a really simple test to run and gives you clear data about what's working well and what's not. In, in these tests, we're gonna look for the amount of movement you can create and how good the quality of movement is. This helps us understand, is the structure of the shoulder healthy? And is the motor control, the brain control of the movement healthy? It requires us to eliminate compensation. So we don't want to look at shoulder movement isolated from back movement. We'd like them to be playing well together where we've got neutral stability through the back and shoulders while the arm moves in a single plane to get an accurate measurement. We only count the amount of movement that the person has full control over. And then when we look at the body, we look for asymmetry. So here's an example. This is a test that we teach in our lower extremity courses. We also show this test in our specialty courses, as well as um, our uh, courses focus on performance. It's the anticoxa or a hip flexion test. In this test, we have our client lay on the back. They establish belly breathing NZR1 control, and then they control moving their knee straight towards their shoulder while we measure the amount of hip flexion that they have. A healthy individual should have between 120 and 130 degrees of hip flexion without any compensations in the back, in the abdomen, in the core. If they don't have at least that amount of movement, or if they compensate a lot in the core or the hips, we're gonna mark that as a deficit. If one hip can get to 130 degrees range of motion, and the other hip, when it gets to 100 degrees of range of motion, there's clenching in the abdomen and tilt of the back, that becomes a key deficit. That becomes the thing that we want our fitness professionals and our clinic professionals all to be focusing on that one movement. Can we improve hip flexion with control on that part of the body? When we have that key deficit discovered, we essentially have our mission. If I see a patient with back pain, and I find that their key deficit is hip flexion. And I want you to think about this. If you see a patient with back pain whose key deficit is hip flexion, what are some of your current methods you can use to improve them from your own skill set? So for example, if you uh, are a chiropractor, you may be mobilizing the hip capsule and pushing hip into hip flexion. If you are a yoga practitioner, there's a few different yoga poses that will either lengthen the hip flexors or drive improved control of hip flexors. If you are a, a kettlebell trainer and we have difficulty with extensibility in the hip flexors, we can do kettlebell swings and we can get really explosive elongation through the hip flexors. Or we can work on uh, holding a kettlebell overhead in like a dying bug position and driving hip flexion. The point is to have a really clear mission, to have a, one single thing we want to focus on and put all of our efforts into changing that one thing. Everything that you could do in our system is valid as long as it improves the hip flexion that's the key deficit which is why GRIP allows you to plug in all of your favorite methods into our system. But 
we've also developed our own unique system, our own unique methods to plug into the system. Now that I had the test figured out, we started to practice with all of our available techniques. All the things I liked to use in clinic, I now had to test these against the grip approach system. And we looked at our data of what got the best results, what got okay results, and which things we didn't want to do anymore. And we started to kind of tweak our approach uh, in order to find our primary treatment methods. But pretty quickly, I found that I needed to make some modifications and I needed to create some new treatments to, to achieve our goals. And here's an example of this. I was working just yesterday with a, a high school football patient who had an inversion ankle sprain and he broke his toe. Essentially, the uh, process on the fifth metatarsal of the foot. We can see this here. He broke this piece of the fifth metatarsal off. The tendon that attaches to it is the fibularis brevis. He landed in this position, and it popped that piece of bone off. Now. The orthopedist looked at this and saw the swelling and said, we need to do an x-ray. So the orthopedist does an x-ray, finds the break, and the recommendations are pretty simple. Wear a walking boot, get some rest for a couple of weeks, uh, and then gradually work back. When we look at it, we know that that's important data, but we also want to know, okay, in a physical therapy setting, in a chiropractic setting, in a gym, how do we help this patient get more comfortable and recover faster? So I need to know what his foot can do right now and what it can't do. And one of the tests we look at is when the foot is on the ground, can they take the small toe and spread it and pin it back down to the ground? So the fifth toe lift, spread, and pin. And we call that test retro-pets. Now, my client could not do that motion at all. It didn't exist for him on the foot that he had the injury, but the other side, he was really good at it. So this became a key deficit. And what it tells me is the muscle of abductor digiti minimi and flexor digiti minimi brevis, both of those muscles were not functioning at their full capacity. And the brain that has to send the signal down here, it doesn't want to move those muscles because of the injury. The brain wants to protect the body and say, whoa, back up. Don't do anything right now because there's an injury here. But as this spot heals, we need his brain to be able to pick up those muscles and make that motion. Now, if you think through all of your systems and we know that there's a key deficit here, do you have specific techniques that will create this motion in the toe? I didn't. At the time I developed this, I knew this was an important movement to test because I had patients with that issue, but there was no one perfect method to create change there. So because of things like that, I started to develop a treatment approach within the assessment of grip that was different from the sources that we put together. It was unique to us. So here's an example. We might take a building block from a system like DNS. Remember, DNS uses baby movement positions to help create exercises for all ages. So this is a position, a prone position from DNS where the client has their hands and knees on the ground and the back is flat and the core is working with belly breath. So our NZR1 is established and they start to drive one knee forward. And you'll see babies do this. They'll bring one knee forward and then they'll rotate to reach for something. So this is a good building block exercise. But when we look at it, the amount of effort within the hip is relatively low. In DNS, we're going to move through neutral ranges of motion. We're not going to really push the envelope many times with standard DNS approach. I love this position. This is where I started working on hip flexion. 
but I had to make some tweaks to this to get the specific result I wanted. I wanted to take a patient who had only 90 degrees of hip flexion, do an exercise that only took me one minute and increase that hip flexion by 10 degrees. And you can't do that with just neutral approaches. So in grip, we start here and then we increase the demand on the position. I may pull back on the knee. I may cue at the pelvis and help push them to acquire a new range of motion. So this is one of the ways that we tweak an existing exercise and make it unique to grip for us to achieve a really specific goal. We've done this and created an exercise for the entire body, head to toe. If your patient or client uh, is having trouble making a movement, we have a test that helps you clarify it and an exercise that can help you improve it. And we call these global reset strategies. So a global reset strategy is using a full body exercise for a couple minutes. Um, if I'm testing it, one minute's enough. But when we apply it in the clinic, we, we do one exercise for two to four minutes. And that's gonna retrain the motor control of the limited mo motion. And then we're gonna progress those loads. We're gonna add some demand by pulling on the area, by pushing on the area, or by adding a weight to it, a resistance band, a free weight, or shifting where the person is in gravity. And then we're gonna dose it, kind of like a prescription. We're gonna tell the person how often they should do this each day at home so we get a better result. The brain and the body usually needs more than just the global reset when we're talking about a clinical setting. Now, realistically, I could run my practice with no hands-on techniques. I could just do assessment and global resets, and I would eventually get good results with almost all of our patients. But I want to speed the process up a little bit, and I want to be able to help all tricky cases. And so exercise is just one way that we can communicate with the nervous system and the immune system to ask the body to change. The other way is via loading the cells using manual therapy. So just to recap here, when I look at a movement, I'm thinking, how do I teach the brain how to improve that movement? And if there's injury there, I think, how do we guide the immune system to that injury to create a change in the cells or to speed up healing? So manual therapy can be really useful at guiding the immune system to make a change. And by doing so, we have an effect on the brain as well. All of our sensory nerves, like our pacinian corpuscles and our free nerve endings, our Golgi tendon organs, all of these nerves are stuck in connective tissue. And in order for them to send a clear signal to the brain, that connective tissue has to be flexible has to be elastic. Otherwise, the cell can't communicate very well with the brain. So if I have scar tissue or a lot of tension in an area, I can use some specific manual therapy to the deep fascia, and I can create flexibility in the tissue that then helps the nerves that are there speak with the brain and improve motion. We call this type of treatment a targeted structural intervention. Essentially, a targeted structural intervention, or TSI, uses manual therapy to directly address movement limitation. We're not using the TSI to address pain. Like if somebody says it hurts here, we don't just go there and do a TSI. But if somebody says, I can't move my thumb in this direction, we know there's a key spot close to that that controls that movement. And we apply our manual therapy to that spot to improve that controlled range of motion. The focus of our hands-on work is always about improving controlled motion. We wanna also use other techniques in this area. We don't have to only use hands-on manipulation. This is where we would use shockwave therapy acupuncture or dry needling, instrument-assisted soft tissue therapies, 
and things like trigger point massage as well. I'm just going to make a little adjustment here for those that have joined us to allow them to join the chat. Okay. Uh, as long as we manipulate the tissues for greater than 90 seconds or about a minute and a half with enough depth and vibration or heat or needling, then we can produce that cell change that's going to improve the way the brain can move the body. Finally, we need to progress loads. So after we've done the global reset, and the tissue therapy, we need to start moving people into a fitness uh, setting. So that might include resistance training in our clinic, and that can be applied to patients of all ages. We also want to be able to discharge our patients when their mobility is improved, their pain levels are improved. We're going to discharge them into clinical fitness. And our clinical fitness classes, we have classes that have attendees where their age ranges from 14 years old to 82 years old. So the approach can be applied to all ages and all levels. And we may also include for some of our athletes, uh, a global performance strategy. So when I work with an athlete that has a specific goal, I'm going to first use our grip assessment to see what's not working well for them. I'm then going to use our TSI and GRS, our tissue therapy and our rehab exercises to improve the key parts of their limitation. And then I'm going to progress them into our fitness facility where we're going to do performance training. We might do some striking from martial arts. We may use um, uh, medicine balls to go through a medicine ball training. I may give them visual cueing all to kind of build up and get back the skill that they're looking for. And we want to make that fun and, and sort of gamify that, that progress, uh, that process for them. So in recap of what we've talked about previously, this is our three-step process to GRIP, which we apply in our clinic and our gym. First, we have the functional range of motion assessment that highlights exactly what the problem is. Then we're gonna we're gonna try to improve that by working with the brain through exercise using a global reset strategy. Can we teach the brain to improve the motor control to improve the motion? We're gonna incorporate a TSI or a targeted structural intervention to treat the physical interface of how the brain controls the movement. And once that functional range of motion has improved enough, we're going to progress loads into performance training, into weight training, into increased resistance by hand so that their ability exceeds the way they need to use it on a daily basis. So on a clinical side, we want them to have more physical ability than the things that are causing them pain. And on the performance side, we need to take their performance beyond the way they need to use it in sport so that the sport becomes easy to them, so that the injuries are less prone. That's where we can take it a little bit further with the global performance strategy. So altogether, GRIP becomes a clinical operating system. It organizes all of the different methods that you use into a single system. It allows every part of your team to work together on a central goal. It makes really complicated cases and methods easier to understand and more functional to apply. And it really helps you become an expert. And that's something that, that our practice is really built on. When patients come to us, they know that we're doing things differently here. They know that our exam is more focused on them and their needs than any exam they've had before. In the gym, they know that we're paying really close attention to how they move and changes that they need to become better at what they're doing. And it elevates us as experts, all because everything's tied together with this clean system. And so for a big practice that might already have two, three, 10 providers, 
if you learn grip approach as your clinical system, it's not going to change. It not, doesn't require you to change what you do on a daily basis, but it is going to show you how everybody can communicate together. It's going to get the whole team on a single page. Okay, so there's a little bit more to present, but I want to give a small break here for question and answer. So I know we have uh, maybe some difficulty uh, with live speaking on here based on the, the system of the webinar, but can we give just a minute for anybody to, you can unmute yourself to ask a question or you can try to type a question into the side. And uh, just so I make sure this is working, I know I've got my friend Jack from Taiwan in here and Jack's mic is unmuted right now. Jack, can you say hi? Hi. All right, hi, Jack. Okay, so our mics, <laughs> our mics are working. Um, so anybody can ask a question about the presentation so far. Uh, well, maybe we'll start with you, Jack. Jack, you've taken our performance classes do you have any questions you'd like me to discuss? Patrick is Patrick is I don't know. Wait, wait. Could you say that one more time, Jack? Okay. Hi. Yeah. More. Would would. Chinese okay? Uh, yeah, Chinese okay. should be okay if we've got Patrick in here to help us translate. There, I see Patrick. Oh. Patrick, I'm going to ask you to unmute. Are you with us here, Patrick? Hi, I'm sorry. Hi. Hi. Uh, Pat Patrick is uh, leave uh, uh, maybe just five minutes. Okay, sorry. is this, no is this yeah. Nora? Uh, so, uh, no, I'm uh, his physio. Okay, great. <laughs> yeah. Would you be able to help uh, translate a question for Jack? Uh, maybe I can try. <laughs> okay. Thank Sorry. you. All right. Okay. Jack, do you have a question for the group? Uh, you can speak in Chinese. Okay. Um, I think this class is a good one. 可以让大家尝试有不同的系统去做结合对那我希望就是这个课程如果来到台湾的话可以用更用更多的东西来去做支持会让更多人想有兴趣来上这个课这样子哦更多的东西是指指因为它有它有它有它有 DMS uh -huh. 有更多的这个课程来去做佐证啊，让这个课程更有系统的东西去做支持结合。对对对，不会有单一的方向。耶耶耶。Okay, uh, yeah. Jack, Jack say, uh, he wants um in Taiwan if we uh use this uh, system, grip, right? Yes. Uh, he he needs some some like dns or another mm -hmm. sister to support mm -hmm. it oh yeah to prove it yeah that mm. makes that's a good he, question he, thank you yeah so i'm gonna okay. try to address this question from jack uh mm -hmm. i talked about the different sources that i used to create grip approach and jack's question is does he need to learn those different systems in order to work with grip approach uh, it's a great question the short answer is no. Grip approach mm -hmm. is a standalone system. So if you learn just grip, we will teach you everything you need to know to apply it the way we do in our office. Now, that being said, if you have the opportunity to take a DNS class or to take a neurodynamics class, what it's going to do is give you a little deeper understanding of how to do some of the queuing. It's going to expand your skill set. But the short answer is no. You can learn just grit and you'll be fine at applying it. Okay, I will trust that's it. 
呃，就就是那个，但是意思是指说，就是你如果学这个 Grip 的话，就完全就是这个 Grip 的系统。那你如果有机会去学其他的那个 DNS 的课的话，它只会就是当做是这个课程的延伸，你有更多的那个方式去 Q Q 别人的动作这样。但是如果说要在这个系统里面学到其他系统的课程，可能就没有办法这样。嗯嗯嗯，了解了解。Okay, thank you for your question. Now,、uh, and thank you for translating. Yeah, <laughs> so no problem. We have we have some help to translate here for Chinese, and we also have、uh, some help to translate、uh, in Japanese,、uh, depending on who has questions.、Uh, but again, I want to open this up. If anybody has a question, just unmute and please ask that question now.、Uh, your questions. Will really only help us improve everybody's understanding. So,、uh, questions in English, Chinese, or Japanese, we can handle all of them、mm -hmm. right now. Any other questions、no. before we continue? <laughs> Okay, great.、Uh, don't be shy. We're going to have one more spot for question and answer in just a few minutes. So please ask your questions when we make it to the next break in this presentation. Okay. I did save some time for Q and A, so don't be don't be shy about、uh, asking those questions. All right. So now we're just going to discuss,、um, you know, who Grip is built for, and essentially. How you can apply it, or what is your avenue for learning? Grip really is built for everyone, and our examples here is、uh, you can apply grip, and we do apply grip in our office to Olympic athletes,、um, but also our everyday work. We're applying this with desk workers, with normal, average people. We also have parts of grip that are really good for working with patients who suffer from chronic pain, and it's important to know that you can use grip even with the elderly,、uh, patients of all ages, including children. So there's no human that grip doesn't apply to. Now, certainly, if somebody is on bed rest or、uh, is in end of life care. There's more important things to do to help them than to use grip approach. But as long as they're in a state that's healthy enough、uh, to heal and try to get better at something, and they're not suffering from a chronic illness like like a cancer, then grip can be applied to those individuals.、Uh, grip can be used both in the clinic and in the gym.、Uh, we can use it in the clinic for our examination and treatment. In the gym, when we onboard new gym members, we can take them through a movement assessment and identify which areas we want to work on with grip in the gym, and we build our global mobility flow through our grip exercises. So, you, if you're a Pilates instructor or a personal trainer, you'll be able to find parts of grip that work really well to improve your skill. And if you're a chiropractor or a physical therapist, or a medical doctor that specializes in orthopedics, your level of examination and understanding and clarity is going to improve with grip approach. So, which avenue should you take? So, there's a lot of different options within grip, and we're going to discuss the main divisions. So,、uh, the first division is our clinical courses. These are the types of courses that.、Um, Offer the the highest amount of information to our attendees. It's going to show the entire system of evaluating with NZRs with functional range of motion screen, and then how to improve that with global resets and with our targeted structural interventions. In our upper extremity course, you'll learn a single test for every movement that the body can make in the shoulder, elbow, wrist, and fingers. And when you run that test, you'll learn an, an exercise that works to improve every one of those deficits and the tissue therapy that you can apply. An example of this:、uh, we're coming to Utah in the U.S. for the first time for a clinical spine course, 
in January. So you can look at the clinical courses as a PT or a chiropractor mm -hmm. or an osteo for that full depth. The other mm -hmm. category that we've been doing more recently is called a GRIP teens course. Uh, we've only held these in the U.S. so far, um, but they may come to Asia uh, eventually. The GRIP teens course takes our clinical course and it separates them into a skill set. So we'll look at the entire body, upper extremity, lower extremity, and spine in a single weekend, all in the rehab category. Or you can attend and go all in the structure or tissue therapy category, or you can attend and do only diagnosis. So it's the full body, but it's separated by skill set. And the reason we did this is a, a big clinic uh, like mine or, or larger than mine, we might have a need for somebody to come in and do more rehab exercises with us. And I don't need them to learn every evaluation. I need them to be really good at rehab. So in this one weekend, you can get really good at grip rehab for the full body. Or I might hire a massage therapist to help us do some of the manual therapy. And I don't need them to know rehab. And I, I don't really need them to be super skilled at the diagnosis. I need to be able to tell them we have a hip flexion deficit and for them to right away be able to apply that therapy. So you can spend a weekend studying just the hands-on therapy. And with the diagnosis, this is great for the lead clinician, the chiropractor, PT, or osteopath that's mm -hmm. taking charge of, uh, of a team. And this is going to show you how to test the person from head to toe. Um, we can also run that diagnosis course as a rehab specialist because it's going to increase your knowledge. So an example of this here at my clinic in Evanston, uh, we have a rehab course of grip teams in September. And I'm inviting some of the students that are going to work with us to attend that class. Our potential future hires are going to come and attend this class. And we're going to train them how to do that skill set uh, in our clinic. And uh, key for this group is our grip specialty courses. Uh, we have several specialty courses, but I want to discuss these three. Our specialty courses focus on a, a single topic that uses GRIP methods, but typically mixes those GRIP methods with another method to form a clean system. So our three specialty courses this year, first, uh, we're going to be in Tokyo, September 28 through 29. And this mm -hmm. course is called GRIP Mobility Reset. Think of this as kind of like uh, yoga via grip approach or movement flow via grip approach. It's a perfect course for movement professionals. And we're going to focus on learning the global resets. So the same exercises that we use for, for rehab, for physical therapy in our office, but then also learning variations to them so that you can apply those exercises to all ages and all levels. And we're going to show you how to turn them into a mobility flow. So you can teach your athlete a lower extremity mobility flow that they can use in their warm up, or you can do an upper body mobility flow in your warm up. And you can use these mobility flows when you start working with patients on recovering their mobility. So if you'd like to improve mobility, not just flexibility, but controlled mobility and help your patients or clients improve that mobility, this grip mobility reset is going to be a perfect course. Uh, my friend uh, and colleague Kazu uh, is, is hosting that and will be there to, to help us with that program as well. Our next specialty course is called the non-surgical hip replacement. We've taught this only in the U.S. so far, but we're bringing this to Taiwan for the first time, October 5th through 6th. This is probably our most exciting coursework currently. This is new material in the past two years that uh, I developed because I was so darn frustrated with degeneration in the hip joint. It was a big problem in our practice uh, of working with patients 
where when they had arthritic changes or degeneration in the hip, we didn't have great options for them. Um, they were often on track to getting a hip replacement. And so I dug into the research and I dug into the methods I was looking at and found a new system for treating the hip where we could overcome degeneration, we could improve the, the mobility, we could improve the pain at a level that, that we just had never seen before in our clinic. So in this class, we're gonna show orthopedic tests, some that you know, and some new ones, grip assessments. We're gonna show you how to mobilize the hip capsule, use shockwave therapy or sound wave therapy on the hip, and we're gonna show you some grip rehab. So this is gonna be a fantastic two-day course in Taiwan, uh, hopefully with, with Jack and, and Patrick in attendance. Um, so it's a great opportunity to attend this new course for the first time outside of the US. And then finally, we've built this into an approach that works well for the knee and for the shoulder. And we're teaching that as a three-day course at my clinic here in the Chicago area. It's our three-day non-surgical joint replacement summit. So one of these days will be just like the class that we're teaching in Taiwan. It will show all of these methods for recovering the degenerated hip. One day we'll be focused solely on the shoulder. Everything we can do to prevent somebody from needing shoulder surgery, whether it's frozen shoulder, shoulder impingement, arthritic shoulder, we're going to show you how we can treat that without surgery. And the final day is going to be on the knee. Same uh, approach. We're going to look through orthopedic assessment, grip assessment, amazing treatment strategies so that you can start inviting people with degeneration in their knee and chronic knee pain and really help them get better at, at, a, at a new, in a new way at a new rate. Um, so this three-day summit is going to be here at my clinic October 25th through 27th. So those are the different class categories. And everybody who attended today, um, you can apply a discount here. Um, if you register early, which we recommend, um, you'll get the best pricing and a free grip t-shirt like the one I'm wearing now. Pretty cool. Uh, and for the US courses, you can use the discount code webinar 10 to take 10% off your course. Uh, that's good for the next week that expires the 19th. For our Asia courses, the price of those course is at its lowest right now. And in August, that will raise a little bit. Uh, we want to make sure we get the, the most people registered early so we can plan a great course. That's a little bit about our courses and, and how to register. So this is our final Q&A break. I know it's a little challenging to ask these questions, but I encourage anyone to uh, ask a question about the material or help clarify their understanding and we'll we'll dig into that. Recall you can unmute to ask a question live, which we have some help to translate for Chinese or Japanese. Uh, of course, I can answer in English, or you can type your question into the chat. So we're going to give this a, mm -hmm. uh, there we go. No questions. <laughs> no questions yet. Yeah. Uh. Okay, well, uh, this this part of this, uh, this is the end of the presentation where um, we definitely wanted to answer any questions. So it seems like uh, there's no questions right now. You are welcome to email me questions at perform at grip approach, and I will dig in and, and give you the, the best answer I can. And you can also message uh, Kazu in Japan or, or Jack in, in Taiwan with some questions. They both have a lot of experience with the courses and we can try to get to uh, answers there. So I wanna thank everybody for attending today. Uh, uh, please reach out if you're interested in a course, get your registration early so we can plan around you, get your free t-shirt and the best pricing. 
and uh, hope to see everybody at a course this year. Uh, thanks for attending. Okay. Bye. <laughs> Bye.